we will continue with our discussion on uh, cell type clustering so in this illustration over here it actually depicts uh, a particular cell which is denoted or colored uh, by this blue color so it uh, denotes how uh, this particular cell actually experiences multiple contexts and which simultaneously actually helps to develop its identity so for example it uh, experiences some uh, uh, like stimulus like um, environmental stimuli such as let's say availability of certain nutrients or some particular uh, ligand uh, coming to bind as a bind a receptor on the cell surface uh, it can also represent uh, a certain stage in the developmental trajectory and uh, also uh, some particular phase in the cell cycle it can represent as well as the spatial context uh, which can actually regulate a lot of things such as the availability of oxygen uh, morphogen gradient and uh, the neighbors and so on so all these uh, different events or biological phenomena together actually gives the cell a certain identity so we are going to look into this cell type clustering where we are again going to talk about uh, how the transcriptional signature can be used for identifying the type of the cells now of course uh, these are like a uh, lot of different ways uh, that the cell can get it get its identity and some of those uh, will also be actually utilized when performing the cell type clustering because essentially we are going to take a look at the whole transcriptome data from individual cells uh, so they actually incorporate in some cases some information about uh, these different identities that the cell actually experiences or different contexts that are experienced by a cell so a lot of different clustering approaches actually exist in literature and uh, here i am showing, only showing some of the most prominent directions for clustering or um, some more prominent approaches for clustering and all these have been actually utilized for uh, clustering the single cells so k-means clustering is a very traditional algorithm that uh, you probably have seen everywhere when experiencing uh, or working with many machine learning problems Hierarchical clustering is again another very popular clustering technique that have been utilized in various different fields. And then we also have this graph based clustering. So all these different techniques have been utilized as uh, uh, you have probably seen in the uh, table that I represented in, pre in the previous lecture that all these methods uh, have been utilized in one form or the other when performing unsupervised clustering of the single cells. Now, in this particular lecture, we are going to mostly focus on the graph-based clustering because the k-means algorithm as well as the hierarchical clustering algorithm are actually mostly covered in any of the machine learning courses. So probably all of you have taken the machine learning course or you are taking it right now. So probably these two techniques will be already covered in that course. So in this particular uh, lecture, I'm going to focus mostly on graph-based algorithm. And another reason is and graph based algorithms are also the most popular ones when it comes to the single cell sequencing data so let's get started with the graph based algorithm techniques so essentially here uh, all the cells are uh, represented as a neighborhood graph where the nodes are representing the cells and edges will represent some sort of similarity and then uh, the essentially this graph based clustering method and they are also sometimes known as community detection algorithms so their goal is to just identify group of cells or group of nodes that are most densely connected so essentially after uh, identifying the groups of nodes then it basically divides the graph into multiple clusters as you can see in this particular uh, representation where let's say let's assume that the, all the nodes are representing single cells and the edges that you see are basically similarity in terms of their uh, transcriptome again um, based on their single cell RNA sequencing data so you see that we can basically color them and uh, these uh, colors are representing uh, different clusters because you see within each of these uh, sub module or sub graphs the nodes are very densely packed whereas there are only certain number of connections between two different uh, sub graphs uh, so for example here uh, there are only three edges that are present between this cluster and this cluster over here so uh, essentially we can see that we can probably partition the graph in such a way so that we can end up with meaningful clusters where within each of the clusters the nodes will be very densely connected whereas uh, 
between the clusters there will be only only very few connections so there are different ways to construct these graphs uh, so one of the most popular ways of uh, uh, constructing this type of graph on which we can perform clustering is k nearest neighbor graph so essentially again we'll have nodes uh, so let's assume that we have two vertices p and q and they will be connected by an edge if the distance between p and q is among the kth smallest distance from p to any other objects or any other nodes in the set of vertices so imagine that in this KNN graph, we are going to connect the nodes, uh, which are also K nearest neighbor of the other node, and only then uh, they will be connected. So essentially, each node here will be connected to its K nearest neighbors. And another uh, type of graph can be actually constructed, uh, which is basically known as a shared nearest neighbor graph. Now, in case of a uh, um, shared nearest neighbor graph, it's actually constructed after constructing the k-nearest neighbor graph. So it actually incorporates some more information. So essentially, here also the weights of the edges, they will define some sort of proximity or similarity between the two nodes. But this proximity will actually be based on the uh, number of neighbors that are actually shared between the two nodes. So let's say if uh, there is an edge connecting two nodes in the shared nearest neighbor graph, then essentially that age weight actually will denote how many numbers, how many neighbors they have in common. So essentially it will denote uh, the similarity between the two nodes it, with respect to the closeness to some other common nearest neighbors. So let's assume we have this particular KNN graph and if we are considering to construct uh, an edge uh, between these two nodes uh, i and j then we see that they have four neighbors in common, like which are basically neighbors to both of these nodes. Then in the shared nearest neighbor graph, they can be connected with an edge with uh, edge weight four. So this is just, an, uh, just a very basic way of constructing the shared uh, nearest neighbor graph from the k nearest neighbor graph. So in fact, let's take a look at a particular uh, algorithm for constructing this uh, sing, uh, share, shared nearest neighbor graph. So first of all, for each data point xi, we are going to compute the k nearest neighbors based on Euclidean distance. And then we are going to put them in a uh, list. And in that list, uh, so this list basically contains the original data point at the first entry. And then all the k nearest neighbors, uh, which are already ranked. So let's denote this particular list as a nearest neighbor of xi. And then when considering to add or add an edge between two particular nodes, uh, so let's say we are considering two particular data points, xi and xj. And now we assign a particular edge uh, between xi and xj if they have at least one shared k nearest neighbor. Okay. And then we have to also assign an, uh, a weight to that particular edge. So if x1 and xj they have uh, shared k nearest neighbors, then uh, we have to assign a particular weight to that. And that weight is actually computed by uh, as a difference between the k and the highest average ranking of the common k nearest neighbor. So let's actually be more concrete. So the weight associated with the edge xi and xj uh, is computed like this. Uh, so again, it's the maximum of k minus half of uh, or k minus uh, average of the ranks of the two rank of the uh, node uh, again uh, between xi and xj where basically v uh, this uh, node v is actually a common or shared nearest neighbor. So this rank function, this rank of uh, v and x i, this actually gives the position of v in the nearest neighbor list. So you see the rank is actually higher if uh, it's, it is more distant from the original node. So rank one node will be again uh, the uh, closest neighbor of that particular node or closest neighbor of that particular point that will have rank one. So further the rank uh, 
the further a node is from that original data point its rank will also be higher like uh, the absolute value will be higher so why do we actually construct this kind of uh, uh, the way we are defining this uh, because in k nearest neighbor graph so we are actually using a very simple euclidean distance metric which is uh, actually um, so this um, k nearest neighbor graph the distance between two two nodes uh, cannot be meaningful may not be meaningful always whereas this node ranking that we are seeing in the shared nearest neighbor graph so the weight of a particular edge is based on the shared nearest neighbor and then uh, it is also depending on the ranking of a particular node so even if the distance actually gets distorted uh, because of uh, let's say dimension reduction or something like that uh, but the ranking will not really change so essentially the ranking of the shared neighbors in a perfect cluster in a genuine true cluster should be very high uh, so it should actually give rise to a highly weighted edge whereas if there are uh, two nodes which are actually from different clusters then their ranking in the shared nearest neighbor should be uh, very low so essentially it will also result in a lowly weighted edge so that's why this ranking node ranking is actually very meaningful in the high dimensional space so now that we have seen the how we can construct different types of graphs that we can utilize for graph clustering so what do we mean by this graph clustering method or community detection technique so how do we define this community or cluster so again communities or clusters they are actually denoted as groups of nodes and they have actually higher probability of being connected to each other than to other members of other groups so think of it as uh, if we have this particular graph then we see let's say within this set of nodes they are more um, connected with each other than to other members of other groups so essentially the goal of community detection is to find a group of nodes which contain more edges inside the group than edges which are uh, linking the nodes of different groups right so the goal is to find cohesive subgroups and that is known as community detection so we can see that in this particular graph there actually exists probably three communities which are uh, actually visualized by these three different colors and we see inside each of this community there are more number of edges than there are edges connecting between uh, these uh, different communities so this will be the ideal goal of the uh, community detection method that we can automatically identify the intrinsic or the cohesive subgroups that are present in the graph and there are different ways to define community so there are some uh, node centric community that can be defined and the most popular node centric community is uh, actually an example is click so click is actually defined as a maximum complete subgraph in which all nodes are connected to each other so again let's consider this particular example so we see that uh, this set of nodes 5 6 7 and 8 they are all connected to each other with uh, direct edges so they actually form a click now the clicks as you see they are also very restrictive in the sense they are uh, they require complete connectedness and in fact searching for the maximum clicks in a graph is a np hard problem so it's very difficult to find the maximal clicks in a graph however the maximal clicks associated with each node can be actually efficiently computed using a heuristic approaches so there have been uh, algorithms which have been developed uh, that applies heuristic algorithms for finding the maximal clicks associated with each node now there are also some group centric community detection methods so as i said like this node centric community detection method uh, or node centric definition of community which is uh, which we saw, saw in case of click that is very much restrictive and uh, it requires complete connect connectivities but in some cases it's it may be acceptable to have some nodes in the group to have low connectivity uh, 
as long as the overall um, connectivity of the uh, whole group remains uh, or it actually satisfies certain requirements so in such cases this group centric community detection methods can be used or group centric communities can be defined and one example of such uh, group centric community is quasi click so essentially here we are looking at a group of nodes uh, which are uh, densely connected but not necessarily complete so this is how we can define uh, so again a quasi clip uh, will be just a subgraph and the subgraph uh, will be denoted as a set of vertices and set of edges and we will call it uh, gamma dense if the number of edges that are present in the particular subgraph divided by the total number of uh, maximum number of edges that are possible if this ratio is greater than or equal to gamma then we'll call it gamma dense so you see this uh, if gamma is equal to 1 then the quasi click becomes a click because then essentially all the uh, nodes are connected to each other so now this concept of quasi click have been utilized in a method known as snn click and this snn click is uh, was actually developed for performing unsupervised clustering based on single cell RNA sequencing data. So this algorithm first actually extracts local maximum quasi clicks that are associated with each node uh, right uh, in the subgraph that is induced by the node and then actually the clusters are constructed by merging those, uh, these maximum quasi clicks. Uh, so basically uh, the nodes will be assigned to unique clusters by merging the quasi clicks. So this technique is utilized by this SNN click method. So now let us talk about how to partition the graphs, right? Uh, so once we have uh, constructed a graph, how do we partition it uh, such that uh, we actually end up with meaningful par partitions or meaningful clusters or communities? So one of the uh, most popular way of partitioning the graph is to um, partition in a way so that um, essentially the number of cut is minimized. Now what is meant by number of cut? So essentially if we are going to partition the nodes then we are going to introduce a cut and a cut is basically defined as the total number of edges between two disjoint sets of nodes. So again let's assume that we are going to cut this graph at this particular edge then uh, the the cut is associated with the value one because it is only cutting one edge again if we want to cut it let's say over here then it's cutting two edges so this cut will be defined uh, by the value two or associated with the value two so the graph partition algorithms uh, they aim to find out a partition such that the cut is minimized the value associated with the cut is minimized so the goal is um, such because if two communities are well separated then the cuts between them should be small that is the uh, sort of hypothesis or uh, sort of idea or reasoning behind looking for the minimum cut so essentially you see that the community de detection problem we can convert it into a uh, problem where we want to find the minimum cut in the network so again network a graph is just a, a network is another name for the graph uh, where it's basically uh, let's assume that uh, we have an undirected graph where edges have no direction and then the community detection method uh, or problem can be reduced to finding the minimum cut problem however you see that finding the minimum cut is not always the best cut uh, just take an example over here so if we look for the minimum cut then we might cut the graph at this position uh, right but it will result in a very small cluster uh, consisting of just a single node or uh, and another large cluster consisting of uh, all the other nodes whereas the best possible cut is probably here it has a value 2 which is higher than the smallest cut or the minimum cut but again it meaningfully clusters the nodes right so this minimum cut problem that optimization function that we are using at this problem uh, is not always the best cut because it can result in imbalanced communities right as we have seen here in this particular example so to deal with that 
more sophisticated objective functions can be used which can consider community size. Now these two are such functions ratio cut and normalized cut. So let's imagine that pi is actually a certain graph partition which partitions the graph into k different clusters c1, c2 all the way up to ck and all these uh, clusters uh, these are disjoint clusters so they do not uh, have any intersection so they do not contain any nodes which are uh, overlapping and uh, by taking a union of all the nodes in the partitions we can obtain the all the set uh, we can obtain the set of vertices right and ci bar is just the complement of ci so it is again uh, if ci is one set of disjoint nodes ci bar is uh, all the other nodes in the graph and then we have another function which is defined as volume of a particular uh, component or a cluster or community uh, right and so the volume of a particular community is defined as sum of uh, the degrees of all the nodes in that particular community so then this ratio cut and normalized cut they are defined like this so again uh, they are normalized by the number of uh, communities and then over all the communities we are going to compute the uh, or we are going to sum the ratio of the cut divided by the total number of nodes in case of ratio cut and in case of normalized cut we are going to compute the ratio of cut of that particular node uh, of that particular community uh, and uh, and the volume of that particular community and we are going to sum it up over all the disjoint uh, communities. So as you can see both of these objective functions they attempt to minimize the, the number of edges. Still they are trying to minimize the number of edges between the communities but at the same time they also avoid the bias of uh, very imbalanced communities like trivial size communities like singletons because we are taking a ratio in this case we are taking into consideration the number of nodes in a particular community or the total number of connections in a particular uh, community right or total number of edges in a particular community so let us look into a particular example of normalized cut again here we are just considering uh, weighted uh, graph uh, two examples of weighted graphs so for example in this particular graph uh, so here the uh, volume function is defined a uh, little bit differently so we are considering all the edges uh, that are present in a particular uh, subset of our um, uh, community. Uh, we are going to sum uh, all the weights on all those edges and that will be the volume function. So in this particular case, if we are cutting it over here, then the weight of the cut is basically sum of these two values, which is again 0.3. Uh, if we consider that uh, one of the communities is S and the other one is T, then if we sum up uh, the volume or if we compute the volume for each of them then it turns out to be 2.5 in for each of them so then if we can uh, compute the normalized cut then the normalized cut becomes uh, 0.24 but in the second example when we are trying to cutting uh, we are kind trying to use this particular cut which is consisting of our uh, four edges then the weight of the cut is 3 and then again we can compute the volume of S and T just like that and then the normalized cut becomes 1.62 which is much higher than 0.24 as you can also see that uh, particularly this cut is much more meaningful than this cut right so essentially by uh, minimizing the normalized cut we can obtain a suitable graph partitioning or communities now it turns out that finding the minimum ratio cut or the normalized cut is also an NP-hard problem. So we basically need a heuristic method to solve the problem. And uh, spectral clustering actually have been used uh, as a heuristic approach for solving the problem, which reformulate this uh, minimum uh, this uh, minimum normalized cut problem as a minimum trace problem, and then uh, solves uh, an eigen decomposition problem. Similarly, this Loven clustering method is another uh, method for uh, finding the communities and markup clustering and so on. And then again, uh, there is this modularity maximization technique which uh, tries to improve the modularity of the particular graph. And modularity is again uh, a particular measure or a particular metric that measures the quality of the community partitions. Uh, 
and at the same time it actually considers the degree distribution of the nodes. So in fact uh, we are going to take a look into Loven clustering later we will see that Loven uh, clustering also uh, uses the modularity, optimi uh, modularity function as an optimization uh, function. So this is just uh, an illustration of how many different types of uh, single cell based methods have been developed. Uh, so as of now you see under clustering it's already uh, like uh, counting to two, almost 200. Uh, so you see there are a lot of different clustering methods that have been developed for single cell RNA sequencing data. So we are not going to uh, focus on a large number of them. We are just going to focus on maybe some of the uh, key clustering methods. Again, uh, of course, these are by no means uh, the most uh, definitive clustering methods. There are a lot of very, very good clustering methods out there. But we are only going to consider, first of all, we are going to consider SIUDAT, which is, uh, I think, the most popular clustering algorithm for single cell RNA sequence, uh, RNA sequencing data. And then we are going to take a look into some uh, possible uh, alternative clustering methods which offer some sort of um, orthogonal, uh, I would say, uh, facilities. So let's get started with SIURAT. Uh, again, SIURAT actually constructs a K nearest neighbor graph. And before that, it actually performs um, uh, a principal component analysis to reduce the dimensionality of the data. And then in the reduced space, it computes the Euclidean distance between each of the uh, each pair of cells and based on which it constructs the uh, KNN graph. Now, after constructing the K nearest neighbor graph, right, uh, in, uh, after that, it actually refines the edge weights. Again, uh, what they are doing with the uh, refinement of the edge weights is they are considering an approach just like uh, a shared nearest neighbor graph. So essentially, you see that uh, they are utilizing this uh, jacquard distance, which is again uh, considering uh, or uh, computing the overlap in the local neighborhoods. So this particular idea of uh, working with the shared nearest neighbor graph is not something that Siurat actually introduced. It was previously used by two different methods, as I said, like SNN click actually used uh, 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 the concept of quasi click, finding quasi click in a shared nearest neighbor graph. And uh, also, there was this method phenograph. And um, uh, this phenograph was mainly developed for single cell data, but not exactly RNA sequencing. So, there also they use this concept of uh, uh, concept, the same concept as is being used in CURAT. So again, uh, this particular toy example over here is uh, showing you how uh, the value of k actually changes your uh, graph structure, the k nearest neighbor structure. So essentially, you see in this particular case, uh, there are um, two different uh, clusters. So there is this particular cluster over here, and uh, the other one is this large cluster. So with k being very small too, uh, it can actually, we can actually see a very much disconnected graph in some sense. And uh, when we go for k equal to 5, then uh, the whole data set gets divided into smaller size clusters, many clusters. And when we increase it to k is equal to 10, then uh, all the cells are actually coming, uh, becoming connected. And, and then they are also uh, being considered as a single cluster. But then when we actually uh, essentially uh, consider the jacquard distance, that is uh, we consider the overlap between the shared neighborhoods, uh, overlap between the local neighborhoods of a two particular cell, two individual cells, then we obtain back this uh, clustering. So we are basically again we are seeing two different clusters. Uh, so this is what they are achieving by performing uh, this jacquard distance uh, or uh, converting it to uh, something like a shared nearest neighbor graph. And then after the graph is constructed, then we have to find the communities. Uh, so for finding the communities, again, CURAT utilizes the Lovain algorithm, which is again optimizing the modularity function. So again, you can imagine that um, essentially it's looking for uh, maximizing the modularity in some sense. So we are going to take a look into Loven algorithm in very brief. So again, it is considering the modularity function, which is given by this particular equation. Uh, 
so in this particular equation uh, a p q is basically weight of a particular connection between two nodes p and q right and k p and k q these are actually some of the weights of all the different edges that are originating from a particular node uh, either from p so that is denoted as k p and then k q is just uh, for uh, the node which is denoted as q now cp is a basically uh, the cluster on to which the node p has been assigned now this delta of cp and cq this is just a dummy variable which takes the value 1 if both the objects p and q are in the same cluster otherwise it takes the value 0 and then m is basically the sum of our um, uh, half of sum of our pq and apq so it's basically sum of weights of all the connection between all the existing objects with, and then we divide it by 2 so this is our modularity function and then this Lovain algorithm actually works in multiple passes. So every pass is uh, um, basically in every pass it tries to obtain the best uh, possible value of modularity and then it goes to the next pass. And uh, this process goes on until there are no further improvement in modularity is obtained. And uh, one good thing about this uh, modularity optimization technique is that uh, we do not have to uh, specify the number of clusters beforehand. Uh, the number of clusters can be chosen uh, while this modularity function is being optimized. Now in each pass they, it is consisting of actually two phases. So in phase one like again let's consider the phase one each node here will be considered as a separate cluster and then the node will be assigned to a cluster that maximizes the increase in modularity. So for every node we are going to uh, find uh, which particular assignment uh, or which particular assignment to the cluster will result in the uh, maximum uh, increase in modularity and then this is sequentially performed for all the nodes so essentially at the end of phase one we will reach a uh, local optimum where the uh, local optimum for the modularity function because uh, modularity value for uh, each of the nodes have been optimized and then in the next phase phase two then essentially we have already obtained a set of clusters from phase one now we weight the edges uh, of the clusters uh, that are connecting the clusters by summing the weights of the connections between the individual nodes of the two clusters and then the phase one is repeated again to optimize modularity so this is like something like known as community aggregation right so essentially at the end of phase one and phase two this is uh, the uh, this is constituting the one pass so in the end of phase uh, one and phase two or in, at the end of one pass the modularity function has been optimized and then we are going to iteratively perform this again and again until there is uh, no further improvement in the modularity now we have talked about some under or over clustering problem with uh, different uh, uh, when we discussed about uh, different clustering pitfalls. Now it turns out that this um, network detection uh, like community detection method or the hierarchical clustering method like sometimes they actually suffer from this over or under clustering problem. To avoid such cases iterative divide and conquer approach is employed. So the idea for iterative clustering is very simple. So again uh, they begin with a very uh, coarse separation of cells and then within individual groups um, the cells are again clustered independently so each group will be reclustered individually and one such method is pan of view so again it um, it's a very simple method but utilizes a new uh, novel function so at the very first step it performs pca uh, reduction right uh, so and then uh, it considers three principal components and with three principal components it applies a density based clustering approach which is known as ordering local maximum by convex hull. So with this particular clustering approach it uh, then clusters the cell into groups. Now out of all the cells that have been clustered it, uh, or out of all the clusters that have been defined at this very first step it actually selects the best mature cluster which has uh, the lowest variance. So it identifies that as the cluster number one, right? And then with the rest of the cells, it is again going to perform uh, the same uh, set of analysis. So first it is going to define a new set of variable genes based on the rest of the cells. Uh, 
and then the PCA reduction and the uh, ordering local maximum by convex cell clustering will be applied and that will actually identify cluster number two and this process is repeated uh, until no more cluster can be produced. So you see iteratively each time it is uh, working with a subset of cells and then identifying the best suitable cluster with the lowest variance. So it also uses Gini index, uh, again uh, Gini index uh, as another uh, metric uh, to determine the threshold when to stop the clustering process. So finally, it performs a hierarchical uh, or constructs a hierarchical dendrogram for all the generated clusters and sometimes it also will merge some of the similar clusters based on the cluster to cluster distance. So it turns out this sort of iterative clustering is helpful when uh, detecting rare cell types and they showed it using uh, simulated data so where, where they used a very small cluster of a predefined rare cell type. So this particular uh, cluster is consisting of three different cells so this is the true clustering and you see this true cluster uh, this very small cluster consisting of three cells was only detected by the panel view algorithm whereas pseudot or scanpy which is and basically both of these are network uh, community detection based algor uh, clustering algorithms they could not detect it as a separate cluster now gini cluster is actually another technique which uh, which is designed specifically for identifying rare cell types so it actually detects this particular cell type but again it performs poorly in distinguishing uh, more frequent cell types So now I will briefly describe this particular algorithm uh, to many cells which actually visualizes also inter-cluster relationships. So you can imagine in case of hierarchical clustering the relationship between the uh, clusters can also be obtained. Now here the concept like most of the clustering methods that we have seen like whether they, those are like dimension reduction followed by community detection or followed by k-means that kind of clusters um, like clustering algorithms do not actually display the intercluster relationships so they are very producing very flat clustering and oftentimes they actually are working with reduced dimensional data in contrast this particular method which uh, i believe was published this year itself or maybe uh, end of last year. So this actually utilizes a very orthogonal strategy. So instead of um, uh, defining a latent dimension representation first, it will basically work with a matrix-free and divisive hierarchical spectrum and spectral clustering method. So essentially the goal is to represent all the cells in a tree-like structure. So you see essentially uh, the different branching points so, so the internal nodes are also representing clusters which can be further subdivided and the leaves are also representing clusters which cannot be further split into uh, other communities now uh, essentially so this uh, you see that um, this particular visualization also has different color codes again these color codes are representing how cell types are changing over different uh, clustering branches and uh, this uh, lot of other attributes can be associated with these branches like uh, some uh, colors can be mixed representing mixing up certain cell types as well as uh, their strength can be represented by the weight of these um, branches so essentially again i am not going into the details of this algorithm but what it does is basically it will construct a network of the cells again uh, so essentially it's using some sort of graph again and this time this uh, network is or the graph is constructed by their based on their cosine similarities and then that particular graph will be recursively by uh, so using and they are using uh, a truncated singular value decomposition now the network of the cells is not constructed based on the raw um, gene expression data but rather they use a, a transformation on the gene expression data and use that transform matrix so by doing so they actually avoid some amount of calculation that is needed for dimension reduction and all those things uh, so the details of the method you can find in the paper itself but uh, in the end they are also this uh, uh, stopping this uh, recursive bipartitioning uh, 
when the candidate split actually results in a non positive newman given modularity so again they are utilizing uh, another modularity modularity uh, uh, function as a, as the optimization so now that we have seen some methods for clustering uh, performing clustering on the single cell data so how do we actually uh, annotate cellular identity with the clusters so that is actually a very important uh, question and in fact there is not a single uh, good computational solution for doing so so very recently some methods are being developed but mostly in the literature what people do is they try to utilize the existing biological knowledge to annotate cellular identities to the clusters so one approach has been that for uh, each of the clusters uh, we can find the set of differentially expressed genes and with those set of differentially expressed genes we can perform some sort of gene ontology analysis to identify the biological phenomena which are mostly enriched for those marker genes so essentially we know in uh, but in some cases people even don't even go into that gene ontology analysis rather they can use just the set of marker genes and overlay the marker genes on each of the clusters so people already have some knowledge about the uh, very specific marker genes corresponding to different cell types so they just use those uh, cell type uh, marker informations to annotate the cellular identities to clusters another approach could be to again utilize the differentially expressed genes and compare them again another data set which is already annotated so that's why nowadays uh, like building or building of uh, or generation of comprehensive atlas for the tissues that is becoming so popular so essentially whenever you have a new uh, data set and from which you identify the cluster you can actually go back to the atlas or a reference map of cell types you can perform some sort of alignment of this new cluster uh, to the existing uh, cell type clusters that are present in the atlas and then you can obtain uh, the identity of the new cluster newly identified cluster from your data set so that's why it requires a uh, very comprehensive atlases of cell types and this uh, different um, i would say like big consortiums uh, that are actually already in place like human cell atlas or uh, hub map from nih they are trying to build these atlases so you will um, nowadays you will see lot of different um, atlases like heart atlas lung atlas or mouse cell atlas and so on brain atlas so all these atlases are being uh, i think generated for uh, different types of human tissues human tissues as well as for other organisms and some examples are actually here so here uh, are two databases uh, which contains the cell type gene signatures so uh, if you are working with let's say human tissues or human cell types or cell cell line datasets or from mouse you can actually take help from this kind of databases uh, such as panglaudb or cell marker so all of these have uh, i think some sort of reference uh, already available for you know, cell type uh, annotation so and nowadays uh, people are also coming up with uh, i would say more automated methods for cell type annotation and while discussing those methods are out of the scope uh, for this course uh, if you are interested i can actually and give you pointers to those uh, particular papers thank you